Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full show times, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Today's show is brought to you by OnPay, the new standard in payroll. You can pay employees and contractors in minutes, automate your payroll taxes and filings, as well as provide health benefits and HR in all 50 states. For more information, visit buildingthefutureshow.com slash onpay. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Celine Tian. She's the founder and CEO at Flowly. Celine, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I think what you guys are doing at Flowly is not only clearly very timely, but but even if that all the craziness wasn't happening right now, you guys are doing something really innovative and cool. But maybe before we get into that, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Yeah, sounds good. Um, well, yeah, we build a mobile app for chronic pain and anxiety, but how we started this journey is really, really far from that. Um, I actually grew up, I would say I spent about half my life in Asia, half my life in the U.S. Um, I was born in North Carolina. Uh, My dad was the head of neuroradiology and MRI at Duke University. Um, And so I was born at Duke. Um, (laughs) Doesn't doesn't really take time. It is. I actually haven't been since I was born there, Ah, Um, but I was born there. And I very shortly after moved to Singapore and then um, then spent the majority of my childhood actually in Taiwan. So half my mother's side um, there from Taiwan. My father's side is from Shanghai. And so I just grew up in Asia, um, grew up, you know, between these different countries. And then when I was around like elementary, late elementary school, middle school age, I moved to the U.S., um, first to San Diego and then to Los Angeles. Um, So I've really been, you know, around the world um, and spent the majority of my childhood very nomadically. No, very cool. So you went to university. What did you take and why? Yeah, I went to Yale and I studied um, English and film studies. And it, it was a culmination of the fact that My first passion, first and foremost, is storytelling. So I grew up writing. I I think I wrote my first, like, novel um, that was never published when I was, like, eight or nine years old. And writing has always been my first passion. And so I knew I always wanted to study English and writing when I was in university. Um, But actually, one of the reasons I had moved to L.A. initially was because my brother and I had started acting. So auditioning, acting, working in film and television and commercials and the entertainment industry. Um, so, you know, your typical like child actor, Disney, Nickelodeon stuff. Sure. Um, so cool. I love storytelling. Yeah, <laughs> I love storytelling through sort of the acting perspective as well. And when I got to college, I decided that being an actor, you don't have that much creative control over the final product. But one thing that you could do is step behind the camera and look into developing the content, whether it's through producing, directing, writing, um, so many different angles. And that's a lot of what I studied when I was in college. And so it was kind of bringing those two passions together and, um, you know, culminating in my thesis later on. Interesting. So walk us through your journey up until um, coming up with the idea of, of Flowly, and then let's get into what exactly it is. Yeah, so... It's a windy road, but we'll get there. Um, It started, you know, I mentioned that my dad is, um, he was a head of neuroradiology. He's one of the foremost doctors and specialists in that area. And actually, when I was growing up, um, him and my mother, they were running clinical trials for pancreatic cancer, um, which I hope, you know, most people never have the experience with. But in its terminal stages, is one of the most painful diseases you can experience. Um, a lot of people that we knew would pass away from morphine overdose and not the cancer itself. Oh, wow. So pain, yeah, pain management is something that 
you know, I've always been very, very aware of when I was growing up, something we talked about. My father actually had passed uh, FDA orphan drug designation for two pancreatic cancer pain solutions. So it's something that, you know, we were very intimately familiar with. But growing up, I kind of stepped back from that, you know, rejection. I don't want to go into the medical field. I'm rebelling against my family. And I kind of went into, you know, entertainment, acting, what I was mentioning. I'm studying the humanities. Ironically, here we are, but uh, we'll get to that. <laughs> so I was, um, so, you know, I was studying film, English. And when I was in college, I decided that I wanted to work in development which in entertainment lingo just basically means content development, you know, actually writing scripts, buying scripts, developing stories in the studio context. So I started as an intern um, at this place called Oriental DreamWorks, which is just DreamWorks Animations, a co-production company in China. So I worked in Shanghai as a development um, intern initially. And then eventually I actually transitioned into working as a contractor on the development team. So helping them vet scripts, um, work on stories, you know, just general content development stuff for both animation projects, but also live action, gaming, things like that. Um, I actually worked part time while I was still at Yale. Um, So I would work, you know, half the week doing development stuff, half the week I would go to classes. I was not a very good student, but I've never been, so I didn't really care. (laughs) Um, So I was very, very focused on my work. And so then I ended up working at DreamWorks Animation in Los Angeles, um, also doing development stuff. And it was while I was there that I, you know, realized the studio life just wasn't for me. It was, to me, a little more stifling than what I loved. And I really liked sort of the fast paced feel of, you know, the startup life, something a little less structured, um, something that was pushing on a more, you know, passion level than a lot of what like studio execs worked off of at that time anyway. Sure. And so when I was at DreamWorks, one sort of blessing in disguise was that they had recently shuttled their VR department, which meant that they had a bunch of VR hardware and um, tech lying around, but no one was using it. And so I convinced this guy to kind of like let me in and play around with the VR stuff there. And I fell in love with it. I was just convinced like, this is the next platform. This is the next thing that we're all going to be into, whether it's in the version that we see it, it now or whether it, you know, morphs into something else, but just the immersion of interactivity, I thought was something that was fascinating. So I ended up actually writing my thesis at Yale about storytelling in virtual reality and how do you actually write scripts and develop content that's interactive and doesn't have like a director's lens on it. And so we, I decided the first thing I needed to do was actually do a VR project. So I left DreamWorks, um, convinced my best friend from Yale who was doing electrical engineering at Hyperloop One, Julian Soros, to kind of join me and do our first project in VR. And then I also asked my DreamWorks contacts, like, please introduce me to the most talented, awesome designer that you know. And that's how we met our third co-founder, Nare Kim, who was finishing her master's at, you know, the very prestigious California Institute of the Arts. And she could have gone to like DreamWorks or Disney or Pixar or whatever, but she ended up with us. That's awesome. (laughs) And we managed to convince her to join our little team. And we ended up building out a team of about 30 engineers, artists, musicians to build our first VR project, which at the time was one of the first VR projects using something called light field technology. And because of that, um, we went to Cannes Film Festival. We were selected um, project that was featured there. Uh, we went to CES and we won an award at the at and Developers Conference. Thank you. Um, and because the VR interactive experience we had built was about Alzheimer's disease, um, a lot of researchers actually started reaching out to us and saying, hey, can we, you know, use this technology you guys are building for um, this interactive experience for our research? You know, whether it's in the medical field, it's in psychology, even sociology, and that kind of got our wheels turning and we were thinking, wow, there's a lot more to this than just pure entertainment. Um, Because one of the other things we had started to build out was biometric feedback, which is something you could do easily in VR because you're wearing literally a computer on your head. We could track things like pupil dilation, your 
where you're looking, um, your body and face temperature. And we wanted how your body was reacting to the content to actually change the content itself. So the content would be reacting to you. And this idea of biometric feedback, when we brought it up with my dad, he was like, whoa, you guys know that biofeedback is a therapy that's been used for decades. Um, it's been used for decades in therapy, in PTSD, um, in OCD, anxiety treatments, et cetera. It's just traditionally very hard to access um, because the way that traditional biofeedback looks, you literally have to find a biofeedback specialist. I mean, how many of you have heard of that? <laughs> I know I didn't before no, this. Fair. And so you find a specialist, you go into their office, and you get hooked up to sensors. So it could be like EEG machine, it could be heart rate, um, heart rate variability, temperature, GSR, et cetera. And then literally in a computer in front of you, you see a graph of your body. So you see like your temperature, heart rate, EEG, et cetera. Interesting. The specialist will then walk you through relaxation exercises like breathing slowly, different um, you know, wellness methods. And then you actually see how your body changes as you learn to relax. And just by being able to see how your body is changing, um, you're learning to better regulate your nervous system, which is just absolutely key to controlling pain, managing how you feel, mental health, physical health, um, down to your physiology of how your parasympathetic system is reacting and being awoken to different stimuli that you're being exposed to. And, you know, this obviously when we learned about it was fascinating for Julian, who's our CTO now, you know, with his electrical engineering background, he was like this biofeedback, there's so many things we could do with this. And then on the content and design side for me and Naray, we were thinking, wow, we could make this something so much less boring than a graph on a computer screen, um, something like a game, something like an immersive experience. And we can all make this accessible on your phone. So. Essentially, what we did is we combined these two novel technologies, which is biofeedback and virtual reality, and we put them onto an app that anybody could access. And we geared this very specifically towards pain and anxiety management because of my personal experience um, growing up around these patients with so much pain. And then also realizing that people that have a lot of pain, the highest comorbidity is having anxiety. Um, and so this is kind of how we first started um, what we're building now. Okay. No, that's that's very cool. So before we dive into some of the features of, of the current version, you mentioned you guys have a team of 30 people. Is that correct? So that was for our first VR project. That was our team of 30 now. Now we are a smaller team um, because we're we kind of focused in on this digital health um, vertical gotcha. and we work with like another extended team of engineers and artists and things like that. Okay. So how did you get the first uh, couple versions of this build? Did you guys bootstrap? Did you raise some money or walk us through that? Yeah. So that was a whole interesting experience because, you know, when you bring this sort of solution to investors, um, surprisingly, most of them have never heard of biofeedback <laughs> or, you know, the combination with VR. And this was, I remember we went to one investor who on his bio page on the, on their website says like, I'm looking for out of the box ideas. We pitched him and he was like, Whoa, this is way too out of the box for me. Um, <laughs> we are like, so, <laughs> we like, okay, <laughs> so I guess we're a little bit different than uh, things that are out there right now. Um, and what we realized more so than getting investor validation is we wanted a clinical and scientific validation. Right. That was much more important to us. Um, and that's also, you know, my background, my whole family, that is something we value a lot. And so we, very early on, we were blessed in that, A, we're taking two therapies, VR, that has also been used decades for pain management, um, that's been validated. It's just that they're inaccessible. So when we go to doctors, nobody ever asks us, oh, is this effective? Because everybody knows it's been used already. Um, mm -hmm. And we got the blessing of the chair of anesthesiology and perioperative medicine at UCLA, wow. um, Dr. Aman Mahajan, who's also now the chair at University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And he's also our advisor and principal investigator on our clinical trials. So very immediately, we, you know, got the validation from the clinical and scientific population. And we built out a prototype sort of kind of bootstrapped and 
um, worked with a hospital in Los Angeles to conduct clinical case studies in which we were able to follow a small group of patients um, who had severe chronic pain and use this intervention of ours, you know, once or twice a week. And we followed them for two months and we were able to see an average of 60% reduction per medication. Wow. So this included opioids like hydromorphone, oxycodone, like uh, fentanyl patch. Yes, yeah, ser- serious, serious meds. Um, and we were, you know, when we were developing this, we were kind of hitting the apex of the awareness around the opioid crisis. And it was just insane to be working with these patients one-on-one and seeing how this has intimately and devastatingly affected so many people in the U.S. And we realized that this was a a solution for them, that we're not saying we're, you know, the magic bullet, but we are one part of a management um, system that a lot of these patients could use to help them either wean off of opioids that they no longer want to be part of or um, to just help them manage their overall functionality, pain, mental health, etc. And so with this data armed, um, we were able to be the recipients of a grant from the National Institutes of Health, um, a 1.2 million grant. Thank you. It was harder than any money we've had to raise. <laughs> I can um, the, yeah, a government grant is just what a tricky business. But, you know, getting that was a huge validation from NIH and the National Institute of Drug Abuse to use this intervention as a pain management tool um, for a lot of people that are on high doses of opioids. And so working with that, we, we partnered with the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center with USC Wow. And we are going to be starting clinical trials very soon, basically as soon as quarantine is over. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair enough. So I was playing with the app this morning, and it's it's pretty much like nothing I've ever really seen, especially in this space. Do you want to walk us through the experience and, and how you actually use the app? And then I want to get into the VR side right after that. Yeah, for sure. So this is really tricky because we're introducing two things that are – pretty foreign to most people, and then asking you to learn how to use it in a short period of time. So one of the things that we decided to do is create sort of an onboarding where we would allow everybody who downloaded the app to do these eight sessions that would teach you about biofeedback, virtual reality, and how you kind of use these in combination or even individually to help with your pain and anxiety journey. And so right now, when you download the app, you know, you fill out some very basic information, and then you immediately get onboarded into this intro experience pack where there are eight sessions, they're each just five minutes, and each session we just introduce you to one more subject. So the first session is very simple. You, every time you inhale or exhale, you tap your phone screen and you hold it down and you see a sort of like interactive effect on the phone. And this is our super easy way of introducing you to the idea of biofeedback which is, you know, when you do something with your body, there's literally an effect on the app, on the experience, on the phone. And in that way, we are also able to track most people's baseline breathing rates. Interesting. And then starting on the second day, the second sort of five minute session you do, um, it starts a diagnostic, which is we're essentially trying to learn what is your individual healthiest breathing rate. It's actually called resonant frequency, but we say healthiest breathing rate, you know, just colloquially. So it's basically the rate at which you're breathing in which you're able to most control your nervous system. So, you know, where you're functioning highly, but you're feeling you're most relaxed. Everybody has a unique breathing rate at which they can breathe at to achieve that. Everyone is slightly different. So you'll you'll see like people say average is six breaths per minute, but, you know, for me, it might be 5.7 for my co-founder might be 7.2, all slightly different to kind of optimize your body. So the next sort of three to four sessions, um, we engage in biofeedback without any sort of sensor. You just put your finger on the back of your phone camera and we're able to get your heart rate data. And that's how we do the diagnostic and figure out what's your best breathing rate. And then there on out, we kind of start introducing you to different types of um, relaxation trainings you can do with doing this breathing rate that we just diagnostic you with essentially interesting and then how does the vr headset play into this so the vr headset fits into this 
um, in a few ways. One is that for, let's say you have like general anxiety. Okay. Um, a lot of people don't require the VR headset, like the relaxation training using the sensor on your phone is enough to help you learn how to control your nervous system. But let's say you have a lot of pain, okay. right? And one of the problems when you have pain is it's hard to focus on anything else. Yeah. A lot of pain patients um, ask us like, or they tell us, you know, we've tried every meditation app out there. It doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Because when you ask someone to meditate, you ask them to close their eyes and focus in on their body. Well, I mean, that's where their pain is. Right. And so this is kind of um, by using virtual reality and externalized meditation. You're learning sort of those wellness techniques. You're learning the relaxation te techniques, but it's all very data focused. And we're giving you an external source to focus in on, which is um, you slip your phone into a low cost VR headset and you're suddenly immersed in like a beach side with the aurora lights above you. You're on a lakeside, you're in a forest, um, you're in a cherry blossom lane and you're, you're immersed in this like relaxing, beautiful world. But at the same time, you're able to learn these techniques, um, seeing your heart rate variability, seeing your heart rate, seeing your respiration, learning how to control your nervous system. And then as you do better and better, the world around you actually changes and reacts to you. So it's gamified. So it presents a really, really nice way of teaching you faster and more immersively how to do these relaxation techniques um, that Lily strives to do. Interesting. So how do you guys decide what activities and scenes to create to treat different types of things like anxiety or stress or the other things that you guys uh, work through? Yeah, that's something that we put a lot of thought into. Um, and this is where I think that my background in content development and mm. our other co-founder Nere's background in design really comes into it. Because we see, you know, some solutions out there that use current games or current movies and TV to, you know, distract people or um, sort of play upon different of these techniques. But for us, we want to create everything in-house because everything down to the color um, to the shape of a tree, to how music um, comes in and out of the scene can deeply, deeply affect pain and anxiety patients. Right. Um, and I mean, it's not hard to, you know, imagine that subconsciously we're affected by everything around us visually and auditorily. And so we put a lot of thought into making sure that the experiences are calming, they're relaxing, but they're also interesting. So they're, they're gamified, but they don't increase your anxiety. That's actually a really hard balance That's to strike. For um, sure. Yeah. And, we, you know, you don't realize it until you try to recreate that type of experience. But it's a very hard balance to sort of um, to execute for something like the therapies that we're building out. No, interesting. So you mentioned a few of the things that you guys actually treat, but you guys actually do a bunch of things. Do you want to talk about all the different things that you can use Flowly for? Yeah. So we focus um, initially on, especially in terms of, you know, when we talk about the product with chronic pain patients and anxiety patients, but this is a tool that is helpful. I mean, I like to say it's helpful for anyone. Um, I don't personally have a severe chronic pain um, or anxiety, but I use it on a daily basis to help myself manage my focus and my ability to relax and um, even sleep at night. That's one of the biggest things we saw even in our initial case studies is that most of our users would opt to do it in bed, okay. um, literally, you know, lean back in, on their pillow with their, either their phone or with their VR headset. You can do it one with or without the other um, and do it before they went to bed because it helps so much with sleep. Right. And we also, we've worked with athletes, you know, to help them focus, to help them train better. And this is something that's also been really helpful for people with autoimmune diseases that experience a lot of mental health side effects, a lot of um, problems with functionality, things like that. So this is something that really, I think most people can benefit from. Um, it's just so happens that for chronic pain patients, this is something they especially uh, can benefit from. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. That, no, that, that's interesting. Yeah, like for me, 
I've always struggled to to be able to meditate because I always my mind my mind wanders somewhere else, right? And I keep like thinking about yeah. something, or it, it I end up falling asleep because I'm just like exhausted, and and so like having something to focus on that's supposed to like help me guide me through that is interesting, right? Because clearly, I, I think for me, and it sounds like that's what you guys have found as well, that a lot of people struggle with that, whether they're dealing with pain or, or anxiety or something else, or they're just, they just want to meditate. Is that fair to say? Yeah, no, of course. And I mean, one in three Americans have chronic pain. That's a hundred wow. million Americans. So that it's in that of high. itself is huge. Oh yeah. It's crazy. Um, if, if you look around you, I'm sure you will know somebody that has been affected if you yourself are not affected by pain. And then build on top of that, that chronic pain is a huge umbrella term, right? There's thousands of comorbidities, including anxiety, depression, um, autoimmune diseases, diabetes, like it, it just, the list just goes on and on. So in some way, most people are touched by chronic pain, touched by um, feelings of stress, anxiety, and performance issues. And so that's a lot of what we're trying to help people with is we understand, like, I'm never going to claim that this is going to be your magic bullet, but this is definitely a huge, huge tool, Except, especially one that is extremely accessible that you could do on a daily basis, five to 10 minutes a day. And I will be the first to say I am terrible at meditation. And it's ironic because my mother is a huge meditator and very good at it. I fall asleep in like 30 seconds. Um, so this has been really, really helpful for me to learn a lot of these uh, sort of techniques without falling asleep or without getting super bored or feeling like I have ADHD. Today's show is brought to you by OnPay, the new standard in payroll. You can pay employees and contractors in minutes, automate your payroll taxes and filings, as well as provide health benefits and HR in all 50 states. For more information, visit buildingthefutureshow.com slash on pay. No, so the, the interesting thing about all, all this then is I, I'm kind of surprised that nobody's really kind of done this before. Or do you just think that you kind of have a unique approach because of your family history and your background and basically the people that that you got in touch with it you know just working that allowed you to kind of put all these pieces together because in a lot of cases you were just kind of guided along some sort of path right and and all the pieces kind of fell into your your lap a little bit like obviously you have to execute and it's way more complicated than that but I think you got kind of lucky of how your career and and kind of family history played out to allow you to be able to build this. Is that fair to say? Oh yeah, for sure. And I, I always, I never want to downplay sort of the privilege that my team has and that we were able to bootstrap this initially before we raised money and capital from investors and that we did have the connections um, in the medical space to be able to um, learn about this, research this, build this out and test this. Um, so there is a lot of privilege in that. There is a lot of luck involved. Um, and I think a lot of it is also the timing, right? We built this at the apex of awareness around opiate crisis. So there was a lot of interest in building alternative solutions for pain management. Right. Um, and also we were at a time when we could make this technology accessible, that we could shrink um, VR into a phone, literally. Right. We could shrink traditional biofeedback into a phone. Um, and make this accessible widely to people. And so there's, there's a lot of factors that play into this, but I think this market is huge. And this is, I mean, so many people suffer from this. There needs to be more work done in this department. Right. No, I 100% agree with you. So how do you guys monetize the platform? Yeah, so right now we are an out-of-pocket expense. Um, it is a monthly subscription. We are twenty nine ninety nine. Um, and annually one seventy nine ninety nine. So we are, you know, using our when you subscribe to our um, subscription, you actually get a VR headset and a Bluetooth sensor that allows us to do that biofeedback um, with your subscription at no additional cost. So we send it to you in our Flowly kit, um, and you're able to get started right away. Very cool. 
so you you guys are also teamed up with Global Giving. Do you want to talk about that partnership and what you guys are doing there for uh, COVID-19? Yeah, so we thus far have actually been in a closed beta. Okay. Um, and we, we were working with um, awesome patient advocacy groups like US Pain Foundation to work with some of their community members in testing the beta and testing the app. But then when coronavirus hit, uh, we saw a surge in searches for this product and engagement with our product and people asking us like, hey, can I use this? Like my mom or my sister or my friend classmate has like a lot of anxiety or feeling really terrible um, during this time, which is completely, completely understandable. There's so much uncertainty. And so we wanted to be able to step up to the plate and think about ways that we could help um, our community and the greater community. And so one of the things we did is we partnered with Global Giving, which is an amazing nonprofit um, that has been doing direct relief work for coronavirus, including supplying masks to hospital workers, medical supplies, um, food for families in need and care for the elderly um, during this time. And so what that means is that in our partnership, every single session somebody does on our Flowly app, we will be donating 50 cents per session Thanks. to their coronavirus relief fund. Um, and we also released it with a special coronavirus anxiety relief experience, only five minutes. Um, but it walks you through, you know, how do we take charge of our nervous system to feel calmer, to feel less anxious, to feel um, more at peace during this time. And it's literally five minutes of your life. When you complete it, it's basically equaled to you donating a mask to a hospital care worker. Wow, very cool. Well, and people aren't commuting anymore, so they they, they have way more than five minutes extra a day, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're right, supposedly. Um, but I think it's still, a, it's still a reminder to ourselves, even in quarantine, that right. you know we should take that time out of the day to take care of ourselves. I mean, this is as much care for yourself as it is care for others, because so much, so much of the times we forget to even just freaking breathe. Yeah. Like I even, I, I mean, I'm the founder of this company and I have to remind myself to breathe and take that time to take care of myself and check in with myself and know like, where am I at? How am I managing my nervous system? How, how am I managing my mental health? Um, so this is just a reminder too, to everybody, take that five minutes, take that breath with us. And then while you're doing it, you know, you also get the additional bonus of helping somebody else. Oh, that's that's very awesome of you guys. Uh, you mentioned something that I want to kind of go back to for a second. You guys were in beta and people were reaching out to you. So did you launch or come out of beta early and let others in or or did I just misunderstand that? Yeah. So literally as of um, this week, we released our app such that people even not in our beta can try it. And the special coronavirus relief experience, the intro experiences, those are all our gifts to anybody who downloads it. So you don't have to have a subscription to do any of that or participate in the donation. Very cool. That's that's really great of you guys. So I know you guys, have, you're just out of beta, you're, you're very new, but how are you guys going to decide where to take this app? Are you going to get a lot of user feedback? Is it going to be a lot of... Um, what comes from the medical community, a bit of both, or how are you guys going to decide how to take this thing forward? Yeah, so we are, well, we're moving pretty fast. Um, we're planning to launch the full product that we had envisioned launching before coronavirus in yeah. about um, a month and a half. Okay. And that includes, you know, sort of all the experiences I mentioned on the app, but also critically, one of the things that we are um, almost done building out is a community feature. Why is this important to us? Um, and it, it's because that a lot of people that have chronic pain, that have anxiety, um, they've experienced their whole life what we're experiencing now, which is basically being homebound or right. you know being on disability where you you know spend the majority of your time alone or at home, not really being able to go out and party with friends, go to work, things like that. And a lot of our community members, they, they rely a lot on groups online or you know friends online um, groups with each other where they're able to share resources but also share their experiences with one another because in a way they have a lot of things that are similar but everybody's experience is so unique 
And so we wanted to give people a chance to share these experiences on our app, um, but also eventually be able to play with each other, um, with and against each other in these uh, sort of VR biofeedback experiences, which is going to be super fun. Um, so we're going to be launching that in about a month and a half to two months. Mm. And every time someone does a session, they can actually earn tokens. Um, and when you get a certain amount of tokens, you can exchange those tokens for real world gifts like CBD oils, um, blankets, uh, you know, body pillows, things that everybody could use in their life for more comfort. Interesting. No, that's, that's very cool. So I'm curious though, you're, you're building something that's obviously clearly complicated, especially in the medical space and in the tech space and, and marrying those two together as somebody that's done projects in the medical space before, it can be kind of tricky. What advice would you give to people that are looking to build something in the medical space? Because you guys are clearly successful at it. You have some big names and you guys are, you know, doing really well and, and you're very new to market. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we, and I think this also ties into our future plans where, you know, I mentioned we have the grant from NIH and NIDA right. and we are doing clinical trials. And I think that especially in, in the space right now, um, in digital therapeutics and digital health, I think there should be more of a focus on being data focused on testing and working with, um, partners at health institutions that can help you validate that product and help you validate the idea that you're trying to build out. Um, their advice, their experience, their validation, it's invaluable for something like what we're building. And so don't be afraid to reach out to these institutions and get their thoughts on what you're doing. Um, and I also think that people maybe underestimate themselves in reaching out to others where I think, especially at academic institutions, a lot of these um, chairs, you know, professors, they're all very, very open to learning more and, you know, learning more about new research that's happening in the tech field. So reach out to them and see what they say. No, a hundred percent. I think the, the funny thing that I've learned and you just touched on it, like e even doing the show, it's like majority of people, if you reach out to them, they're willing to at least get back to you. They might say no, but you'd be surprised at how many people say like, yeah, I'll have a look at that. Or yeah, no problem. Like, let me help you out with that. You would be absolutely surprised at how many people just will help you out or, or give you your thoughts or, and you, you never know where it's going to take you. And sometimes it might take you 10 tries to get a hold of somebody or a hundred tries, but you know, anybody that's ever been really successful at this just decided to go for it one day and, and started trying to make connections any way they can. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's like my whole, <laughs> that's, if you could sum up what I do, that's being shameless um, <laughs> and reaching out to people. Because I think I mentioned that when I was growing up, I, w I was an actor in, right. you know, film and television. And anyone who's been through that will know that the number one thing you learn is how to manage rejection. Sure. Because you audition, your, your whole work is basically auditioning. And then sometimes you get the silver lining of acting. Um, and when you audition, you get rejected day in and day out. And so from a very, very early age, I started acting when I was eight, okay. um, I knew how to handle rejection. And so, you know, even how I got my job at DreamWorks, how I, you know, was, I worked with nonprofit, I worked for um, a, an incubator that was part of the Teal Fellowship, like all these different things were just things that I had gone out and reached out to people that most people I think wouldn't even think to reach out to. Sure. And then I did end up hearing a response. So you got to reach out to like, hundreds and hundreds of people and then you might get a few responses back but hopefully yeah. one of them you know it, it leads somewhere no it's interesting and i'm glad you said that because it's like i can't even remember how many times in like one day i don't hear back from somebody you're right like you might send 100 yeah. emails and you might hear back one or tw two times but you need to send 100 more to get one or two more right and then you hope you get five or 10 after you send out a thousand emails and one of those leads somewhere. Right. And I'm not even exaggerating the numbers. It's like you almost just like when somebody doesn't write back to you, you almost just like forget about it. Or somebody says like, no thanks or whatever. You just need to like, you can't even think about it. You just need to say like archive that or delete that email and forget about it. 
Who cares? Yeah. Right? And nobody knows, like nobody knows other than you and I saying it right now that we reached out to a thousand people and heard back twice or 10 times or whatever, right? Like, don't tell anybody. Like, it's not really rejection if nobody knows you got rejected, right? Yeah, and I feel like a lot of times in when you hear about other companies or other founders, successful founders, that's, you don't hear that as part of the narrative a lot, the yeah. early days of being rejected so much. But I, I think that it needs to be out there more because it's the truth. Like you are going to get rejected over and over and over. You just need to know how to frame it in your mind such that you push forward. And I think that's just the overall story and lesson I've learned in building a startup and my whole team has learned is you just have to constantly reframe things in your mind, reframe your perspective such that it actually is a positive thing you can push forward. Well, and you also need to try different things, even with the same content, like, you know, I right. have 10 different versions of basically the same email or five versions of the same email and see what's working and not working. Right. Right. AB testing those emails. For sure. No, that's, that's really good advice. Is there any other advice you'd like to give to others out there as we're kind of coming to the end of the show? No. I don't know if this is so much advice as this is something that I've looked out with, okay. which is surrounding yourself with the right team. Yeah. Um, I am so blessed that I have the best co-founders. I, I truly, truly do. Um, everybody that's met us all in person, they that's the, one of the first things they say is like, wow, you have a really, really good team. Yeah, which is and so hard I, to do. It's so hard. It's so hard to do. And I can't even tell you the amount of times I've met with other founders um, really, really successful founders. I've been like, yeah, my co-founders were shit early on, or, <laughs> or even if we, yeah. even if they weren't shit, even if, you know, we were all individually great people, we didn't work well together. Yeah. And this is something that I think that you have to put time into, which is finding the right people and finding people that work well with you, not just because, oh, they, you know, they have the right resume, but because you guys have a synergy that nobody else can replicate, especially in the early days. It's so, so key. Um, and we are very, very transparent with each other. Me and my co-founders, we communicate over everything. Um, and it's just been the biggest blessing thus far. No, you're totally right. Cause you can have, you can have 10 of the smartest people on the planet as your co-founding team. But if those 10 people can't work together, you will go nowhere. Like it doesn't matter right. how, like how smart people are if they can't work together. Right. And I'm not saying don't try to get smart people cause you should, but like, you there's so many things to balance there and and you're absolutely right it's it's really really challenging but we're kind yeah, of yeah no oh, it's, go ahead it's sorry the hardest yeah oh no i was just echoing how hard it is no, <laughs> because fair. I know. very cool so we are coming to the end so how about we close with mentioning where people can get more information about you guys and any other links you want to mention yeah, so you can find all the information we just mentioned um, on our website, www.flowly.world. So it's F-L-O-W-L-Y dot W-O-R-L-D. Um, you can find information about the coronavirus partnership with Global Giving, how we're donating for every single session you do. You'll find our app link, um, the story about our team, anything else. And you can also reach out to us on the website. We love hearing from people. Um, good feedback, bad feedback, you know, stories, experiences, questions, reach out to us, reach out to us. We're early stage startup. We are building it out with you. So reach out. Perfect. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show. And I look forward to keeping in touch with you and have a good rest of your day. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community. Sign up for our newsletter or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.